So welcome everyone to another community call where this week uh, we want to focus on our upcoming bounties feature. Uh, over the weekend, Kobe actually got like the V1 of bounties uh, shipped to staging. So we saw like the first version of it and it's looking like really good. Um, one thing is it's like kind of a complicated uh, uh, UX. There aren't a lot of websites that do similar things here. There's kind of Dwork, which is like a Kanban board style bounty feature, but we want to integrate it more into the actual like paper page of the website. So there may need to be like some iteration on like exactly what the feature looks like. But overall, I think it's like a pretty impressive like first start um, for Kobe just kind of like pulling it out of thin air on how the design should look. So definitely excited about that. I, I think like one thing um, that we've talked about a little bit internally um, just as like our engineering team is that we'll ship features for Research Hub, but um, just due to the nature that we're a small team and I'm the only like non-engineer, um, we don't do a ton of like marketing around it. So sometimes like we'll ship features and they won't like have like adoption kind of immediately, just like, you know, any kind of product, like you have to let people know it exists for people to want to use it. So what I wanted to do with this call is kind of brainstorm like a marketing strategy around like how we're going to make people aware of this bounties feature once it ships. I think one piece of context here to me, I'm like very, very excited about this because like one of my like core theses like from like a decade ago when like I first started to think about this as a PhD student was um, I was running experiments. And I would have like 45 minutes of downtime, like while a gel ran or something like that. And I would just be on Reddit, kind of like looking at like hockey scores or just like random stuff. And if I had the opportunity to make like five bucks for like sharing my expertise online, I would have totally done it just to like go get dinner or something like after work. Um, and so I think we're finally getting to the point where like we're getting close to that where you'd be able to, in theory, like as a grad student or something, um, like trade your time for like financial value that you can then, um, you know, use to go get dinner or something. And so to me, I feel like we're finally getting to the point of like financial value transfer on Research Hub. So I think there's a lot of promise here. And um, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are a lot of scientists that would appreciate like a, another like I guess, side income stream. So the first thing that I wanted to do was think about like, who is the target user? Like for maybe the first like three months of this bounties feature, like what does kind of like a character sketch of both like who's going to be creating the bounties and who's going to be like actually uh, creating content to fulfill the bounties. And then once we kind of nail down that, thinking about how do we get in front of those people and like, you know, I guess like pitch the value prop of, hey, earn some, you know, research coin for sharing your scientific expertise. So yeah, to get started, like thinking about like, who are the people who are gonna like create bounties on Research Hub? Jeff? I think like it'll probably flow the same way that it flows by word of mouth in a lab based on the hierarchy. So I think it would be that an undergrad would want to create a bounty to ask a question for an assignment or some like research or something like that. And then a grad student would probably try their best to answer that. And then likewise, you'd have a grad student post up a bounty for maybe a little bit more complex of a question. And then you'd have like a early career like PI or like a postdoc that would answer them. And then I think you would probably have a grad student postdoc or early PI putting up requests for peer review, probably for like a preprint. And then you have people at the equivalent level as kind of like a horizontal input, uh, give input on like a, as a peer review. So they would answer that bounty with the peer review. That's kind of how I see the flow of that. Okay, so that makes sense. So we've got like a couple of different kinds of bounties um, in theory, like question and answer and peer review. So yeah, I, I hear what you're saying where it's like uh, the questions will come from less experienced sci scientists to more experienced scientists and kind of the same for peer reviews. Does, uh, yeah, I guess one, one thought I have about the undergrad, um, like do they have money to spend on this? 
like um can can they put you know 20 50 bucks on like hey um you know someone do a lit cited for this question or something like that yeah i think so i think like um i remember when i was an undergrad like there was these like kind of spark notes summary booklets of the notes for courses that um, was offered like via a third party uh, and they were something like 20 to 50 bucks a quarter uh, and a lot of students would opt for that because it kind of made and streamlined their life a little bit. So I, I think, and this is digitally native, so I, I think it would be like pretty appealing to the people that are undergrads now, which by the way, they're all born in the years 2000 and upward, which is really trippy. But yes, yeah, so I think they're more like, they're more like digitally native. And I think they would probably appreciate something like this a lot. Okay, cool. So undergraduate science student is someone who would want to like create a question. That's a good uh, profile. Anton? Yeah, that's interesting because I was thinking uh, of, of a completely different opposite stream uh, where the more experienced members of academia would offload their work to someone less experienced, right? So the other way around. So the PI would be like, okay, so that's a simple task for five people that doesn't need my attention, right? I could request is bound to be done by some random grad student basically uh the reason i'm thinking that is because <clears throat> creating tasks surprisingly requires uh, a certain degree of experience and uh motivation and organization that's why i'm thinking the more experienced people will have easier time coming up with the with the tasks right because it's not a trivial uh, activity in my mind so this is awesome like defining like who the potential customer is and why they'd want to use it because when we pitch it the pitch to the undergrad will probably be very different than the pitch to like the postdoc so yeah thinking through the logic here like i think both are reasonable and then we can test out you know like cold emails to people and like see what actually gets responses that's that's another good one yeah, I think it mostly like depends on the nature of the like the bounty that's being proposed, because like uh, if it's something where it's like information based, where like they're just trying to like garner information about something, I think it might be like a more bottoms up. Uh, but I think if it's like a task based, it's going to be more top, top bottom. The, the undergrad uh, suggestion is interesting, too, because just randomly I saw on Reddit the other day. Um, it was like some undergrad science writing club that uh, wanted to pay people a hundred dollars in order to like do like articles about different, you know, like layman summaries about different research articles. So like, I think there are a lot of like little science writing organizations that we'd be able to reach out to and say like, Hey, like if you want to earn money for creating science content, you know, here's like an opportunity to do that. Um, yeah. And a hundred bucks is, you know kind of a lot or you know would have been for me when i was in uh undergrad yeah i also see a benefit um for maybe smaller labs um as an undergrad and as a post back i was in larger labs um that always had postdocs that were available for like the grad students and undergrads to like go to but um throughout my whole phd i was in smaller labs and like postdocs are actually like very rare um like in our department so I could see a benefit to labs that can't really afford a postdoc, but might need to outsource um, to a postdoc for like a single project or something like that. Okay, cool. And would that be, do you think like a PI? Like who's, who's the person that we would I, want? I would to assume that would be like a PI, like maybe a PI and a grad student, you know, or a couple of grad students could realize that they could use the help of a postdoc or like, you know, the PI can't really get involved, but if the grad student could be like, hey, like, you know, I could use like some help from somebody who has a little more knowledge. So maybe the PI would front, you know, a few hundred dollars or something to get that for like a whole project, you know, and that person might get authorship, who knows, you know, but that's just something I, you know, I actually just thought of this now with what Jeffrey was saying, but you know, I, I realized that it could be a benefit for smaller labs that have some discretionary funds, but not like a lot. And it also could help postdocs supplement their incomes and uh, postdocs have really, really crappy incomes and a lot of skills. Totally. And, and so this would almost be like a, like a consultant of sorts. Like you want, I guess so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, and great. postdocs can even like sign up, you know, we could have like a, you know, this would be later on, but we could even have like a, a consultant sign up ability, you know, like if you want to be contacted for that, you know, we could send bounties to your feed, who knows, but that's something that we could maybe think of developing. 
Yeah. So, so just a little bit of context. Also this weekend, something I saw, a uh, collab tree, which is sort of like a scientific freelancer website where you can hire, you know, PhDs to do random tasks um, on an hourly basis. Uh, they earned a portion of a $175 million contract from NASA to help them like sort wow. of, yeah. So there's money in that. There's actually probably a lot of demand for something like that. Like, putting out projects and having people come in to fulfill them. Um, so that's a great idea. Uh, Malik? I mean, uh, as far as the tasks, like in medicine, I can think of like two things that would really help uh, is one is statistics, uh, you know, like for any data that you have and you want to form a hypothesis and run the numbers, I mean, uh, medical professionals can always appreciate some expert statistician who can do that task for them and more so like also, make sure their hypothesis is, you know, in line with what they're trying to, con like what they are concluding and stuff. And they are not, you know, doing, um, forming the hypothesis after getting the data or vice versa, something like that. That's one. And then second, um, you know, for um, like review articles and, um, you know, some of the scientific like textbook chapters and stuff, like just medical writing can be appreciated, you know, like where um, some people just have good um, skills, but writing you know with the references and stuff and you know physicians can really appreciate that in medical research yeah. okay cool so just thinking about like kind of how we structure this um do you, do you think that uh these physicians would be okay with having like the statistical help happen in the open or is it something that needs to be private behind closed doors uh because it's contributing to a future publication that's a good question. I would say uh, it, it can be both. So like, let's say if it's a new medication that's running like a randomized um, controlled trial, then I think they might not want it to be out in the open yet. But if you are running like retrospective studies or, um, you know, cohort studies, then um, then yes, they will be fine with it being out in the open. Like uh, if you see it like Mayo Clinic, um, you know, publications, um, you know, they um, they have been pretty much um, doing cohort studies for pretty much any disease and the experience at Mayo Clinic in the last 20 years. So like, um, you know, like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And their data is pretty much out in the open and they're fine with, um, you know, um, people commenting on it before even publication um so um yeah for cohort studies and retrospective it'll be okay but I, I i can see them being not cool with it if it's a randomized clinical trial yeah i i like that idea a lot it feels like it's getting into like helping people find collaborators and like co-authors and stuff which i think is a like would be a very cool thing in the future um Okay, so just kind of like like rounding this out so far um, on on like the side of who's going to create these bounties and spend money for content. We have undergraduates who would need help with like uh, either their classes or like some early lab work that they're doing. Uh, more senior scientists who want to like unload work onto undergraduates. Um, kind of like I think Jeff's example where like uh, there was a new protocol and he wanted like a bunch of different papers like describing the methods for a certain protocol. Um, we have like, again, like a PI or a senior grad student, um, who would want like a, a consultant of sorts. And that kind of fits like the medicine value prop too, where it's like a senior scientist who needs help, you know, from another expert, uh, who they don't have available within their own lab. Um, and then also another one, which is like, uh, medical writing. So if I put like a, a manuscript out there, I could, um, like give a bounty to someone who's maybe like a good writer and they can spiffy it up for me. I know a lot of journals kind of provide that service too, like editorial services. So that could actually be very cool. It's like connecting um, like English majors, you know, with scientists in order to help them with their writing. Um, does anybody else have any ideas on like the the buy side, like who's going to be creating these bounties? Uh, a topic? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so... Uh, my idea was outside of academia. If we're uh, if we're ready to go outside of academia, uh, there are a lot of these science communicators who are slowly getting big on their platforms. Require researchers, right? Uh, and they often end up hiring interns who can do their research for them. So, for example, I mean, I personally know a guy who's not even at a hundred thousand subscribers and is already uh, hiring full-time researchers. So. Uh, 
counties could be a way to outsource that on a case by case basis instead of having to hire your own team as uh, as you grow so that could be a way that could be something that we could look into bespoke research right yeah do you have a link to this person that you could send me just to so i can get a better idea of like uh yeah yeah the demographic cool yeah thank you um ricardo yeah, similarly, thinking about academia, you can think about, you know, people from industry or even like small startups that I did, you know, the, at the beginning, they really require a lot of like uh, research expertise. So instead of hiring, you know, full time uh, people from academia, they could put up some bounties or people like, I don't know, summarizing the state of the art for, you know, a specific, I don't know, device or technique or something. So I see a potential buy side from people from industry um, in here. So yeah, this is uh, the um, use case that Max kind of cited was like, he's busy, he doesn't want to read like all of the research that's coming out every day. So to have someone who can do it point to him, like what's most valuable in like the research that came out in the last month in his field. Yeah, especially because, you know, some sometimes people from industry, they're not that as skilled as, you know, academics or researchers in, in you know, in a scientific field. So it could be even, you know, better for them instead of like spending up a huge amount of time to delegate that to a person that knows even better. Yeah, I like that use case a lot. I guess, Ricardo, do you think um, uh, like startups would be OK with these types of requests and like the resulting information being out in the open? Yeah, that's something that I was thinking about. Uh, could be could be a delicate. Uh, yeah, could, could definitely be a delicate matter for early stage startups. Um, but you could still use this. Uh, Hmm. To get some, you, you can kind of like filter the information that you want to get and filter those that you think can, you know, can get out on the open and maybe get like an initial understanding of uh, what's out there. And then if you want something more in detail, you still have the contact of the person that answered you the bounty and can offer something else privately and bring it to the next level, for example. Totally. And, and I think like it's it's worth exploring regardless, because if there's demand, but they need, you know, some element of privacy to it, then that's a feature we could easily build. And yeah, startups, you know, they have budgets. So oftentimes, like, like they do have the capital to spend on this kind of thing. Uh, Jeff? Oh, Jeff you yeah. yeah, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, OK. Uh, Ricardo's comment reminded me of um, a time. So um, I used to work at a biotech company for two years. Um, called BioLegend, just to manufacture like antibodies and stuff. And I was really close with um, the VP of uh, uh, research over there, um, this guy named John Ransom. And I remember um, inviting him out when I started at UC Riverside to come to UC Riverside to give a talk. And I remember he, uh, he, he had just started a new startup with some of his friends. And he came and he met my current PI, who is kind of like leading in like kind of virology, but mainly focuses on microglia. And I remember he just had like a like a bunch of questions, you know, for him, like, oh, what kind of cell line should we use? What are the pros and cons of, you know, using this mouse microglial line versus that human microglial line? And so there was a lot of like communication and discourse between them. Um, and I think it would be cool for that to happen over Research Hub kind of in that example, because he was in the field of like the industry startup and my PI was really knowledgeable on that like kind of specifics of the cell lines. Um, and I think that information is pretty benign, like the fact that like publicly someone would know that he's looking for a microglial cell line um, doesn't seem like it would need any privacy on that front. So I think that'd be a cool one if we had some of those higher up people on Research Hub. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to throw in there was like piggybacking off of Molex, um, which would be like actual translator um, like bounties. So like editing English and stuff, but like if someone needs it fully translated, into English would be a really, really appealing one too. That's good context. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that is actually pretty exciting. That feels like a low, low weight. Like it'd be easy to pitch the startup side of that. And then also once we have the bounty there, we could get like some high quality scientists to come in and collect it. Like it seems like a, a great cold email to like PIs to be like, hey, come here, spend three minutes of your time and earn, you know, hundred bucks or something. Just one thing to keep in the back of our heads is, um, there's a like a upper cap on certain PI's ability to monetize off of things, depending on how they're funded and if they're part of school of medicine. Um, so just to keep in mind when you work 
when we get up to those higher up people, the, uh, there's like a cap. I can't remember some amount of hundreds at one given moment, or if they work for the government, for example. Totally. Yeah, that's that's good to know for sure. Um, okay, so just to try and organize this, and I think we should prioritize a little bit because once we ship the feature, we can try like two or three like marketing strategies to to like uh, I guess get in front of these groups and see if there's any interest. Um, so undergrads kind of senior scientists who need consultants or want to unload work, um, physicians uh, for paper writing or like uh, layman summaries, um, scientific content creators for research, biotech startup for research, that's basically the same, like kind of like private scientists uh, for research, and then translation. Um, which ones do you all think are like the most promising out of those that we should give a shot first to? For me, uh personally um like if i have to think what i would pay for is if i'm writing a review and i need some papers for you know to compile that table with all the font with all the references that'll be the first thing that will that i could you know easily pay off so that's kind of like the senior scientist uh unloading like their their work to someone who can yes yes like i don't know postdocs that has to write a lot of papers and maybe has to write a review uh, cause that was demanded by the PI, but they also have to do lab stuff and they also have to coordinate the graduate students. If they could unload some of that work, that'll be a huge, uh, yeah, load off their shoulders. Cool. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts? Me personally, I kind of like the the biotech startup slash science content creator just to get like a, a little bit of a different demographic out there to see if like non-academics have like a, you know, more of an appetite or less of an appetite just to kind of feel that out a little bit. I um, I, I like both of those actually. The, I'm, I'm on board with both of those. Um, the reason I, mess in, I, I first mentioned the undergrad one be, because I um, kind of surveyed an undergrad from my lab that's working under me on um, whether or not she would use a feature, this specific feature. Um, and she came in like not knowing like uh, anything about lab or which protocols to run and what they mean. And she said that her and her friends that are undergrads in labs feel a little bit like kind of out of the loop sometimes, and they would definitely do something like this. So that's, I've gauged like maybe three to four undergrads and they said they would be interested. So maybe there's something there. Yeah, I think we should definitely give it a shot too, because with the undergrads, the one thing I'm thinking is like, even if you don't have money, like you can get research coin by contributing content. So, you know, maybe if you need something done, you're like, okay, like I'll post papers, you know, for a week beforehand and add some comments and get some research coins. That way I can have someone help me out, uh, you know, with this task. Or maybe even like um, help the grad student or postdoc that needs summaries. summaries. So it's like this kind of circuit where um, they help them, they earn the research coin, and then they use those research coin. And then another grad student or postdoc earns it by giving them the information that they want. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I like that. So uh, does anybody disagree with this top three of senior scientists who um, want to offload, uh, for lack of a better term, like busy work to people who have more time? Um, private scientists, uh, who like have questions from academics who are more familiar with like specific protocols and then um, undergrads who have like questions about how to like, uh, you know, be as impressive as possible while they're like rotating through labs. Works for me. If, if I can put another one in, in the bucket uh, that just like came to my mind, uh, if you can sort of like value the time of a experienced postdoc um, in terms of like using some specific machinery, like for example, I had to use a, I had to learn how to use a really complicated machine, and my postdoc had to spend a lot of time teaching me how to use it. If they could make a video and kind of like monetize out of that, that could be a really another like really interesting use case in that in, in this regard. And that it, you know the matter here is just evaluating how much how valuable it is. You know the time of a postdoc registering that video and pulling and putting that up on on the website yeah totally and like uh with new iphones and stuff i feel like uh it's like pretty easy to make videos so that could be like not that much time spent in production um for someone to like share kind of how they uh you know interact with different 
I guess, protocols. Cool. Um, yeah, so, so thinking about the other side of the marketplace here, like if I'm a senior scientist who's unloading work, um, would that be, that's still like kind of academic labs, right? That we'd be reaching out to, um, to, to, I guess, create the content. Yeah, I think it would be kind of academic to academic is kind of that communication. And then, um, I think for just like a bit of use cases, the biotech to academic, like we were mentioning, Pat, but um, I'd say for the most part, it's kind of going to stay in that uh, academic circle. Okay, cool. It, it seems like uh, all of the content creators for all three of these groups are like, uh, you know, mid-level to senior uh, academic scientists. Um, so that makes it easy, at least for the supply side, we'll be able to like kind of get in front of people all through one uh, channel. So then, yeah, I think thinking about like, um, how do we find these people who want to create the bounties? Like, how do we get in front of them and let them know like there's an opportunity to or potentially like save them time and money? Um, if I'm like a, a, you know, postdoc or like a PhD student who's like super busy and I want to offload stuff, how, how do we get in front of those people? Is there any big forum uh, that, I don't know, academics use, uh, people from academia use? I'm not familiar with those, but maybe there's a big forum where scientists discuss uh, research. It's like Biostar for uh, bioinformatics, and we could like pay for ads on ResearchGate or something like that. But I think we should try and do something uh, that doesn't cost any money and is just like either us reaching out to people or like, um, like I saw, like, this is a bad, uh, analogy, but when Reddit first started, they like hired people to do like sidewalk chalk at UVA to be like, oh, Hey, come to Reddit. You know, um, it's just like undergrad students who'd walk by and be like, okay, fine. I'll like search on my phone. Um, yeah. Like ideas on how to get in front of people without necessarily like doing Facebook ads or something like that. You know, not contacting institutions uh i don't i don't kind of like be present at some big conferences maybe conferences is not the best place maybe you know the cold emailing kind of thing could be could be could be a good idea are you too overwhelmed from the work that you're doing in your lab do you want to offload some of the work you know that on research shop you can create bunches and ask other people to do the not like really the work for you but kind of like helping what you're doing the cold emailing one could be an initial start and see how it goes from there. And maybe, you know, try to do, do something through uh, institutions. Would cold emailing actually lead to that many people though? I feel like we've been doing that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, but it seems like maybe we should have something with a little bit more scale. Cause I mean, researchers, it seems like don't react to most emails, right? Just, so I've had a lot of success with cold emails in the past. I think it's it's a lot of how you phrase it. Like if it's okay. a marketing email, people will ignore it. But if you you know make it clear you're a real human being who's like looking for feedback, not necessarily like trying to sell something, but just being like, hey, we're building this thing because we want to like you know make your life easier. Like, do you mind hopping on a call with me and like uh, letting me know what you think about this idea? Then people are like really trying to help out a lot typically. So it, it's all kind of like in how you phrase it um, and who you target in theory. Um, in the past, well, that, had... that was sort of my point though, because you're talking about doing something like that and then getting on a call and talking to someone. Is that something that uh, we can do to get like a large amount of people actually using, or are we not looking for a large amount of people? Do we just want to see if there are a few people uh, who would use it uh, to get answers for those kinds of questions. Because if if we're just looking for like, you know, five, 10 people, maybe cold emailing is a good idea. Um, yeah, I think it could start yeah. off really small that it's like uh, this bounties feature, you know, as we've gone over just in the last like half an hour, there's like a bunch of use cases. And so like, we'll probably end up getting one or two of these use cases that actually works really well and like figuring out how to scale it up. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think I think it can start with like, you know, like, getting 10 people on a call 
And then like maybe three of them are like, this is the dumbest thing ever. Why are you doing this? You know, five of them are like, oh, cool. Good for you. This is great. And then maybe two of them are like, oh, let me tell my friend about this, you know, and like maybe we'll do a bounty. So it, it takes a lot of, it's like a heavy lift. Like it's one of those things that's like, uh, you know, like Y Combinator or Y Combinator says do things that don't scale. Like it's unreasonable for us long term to be doing sales like that. But um, it's good initially to get people excited, put a human touch to it and actually get feedback uh, for kind of like on the right direction. Uh, Safik? Uh, could we maybe attract postdoc students by uh, by putting out bounties that they'll be able to do within like 10 minutes, but that will pay them irrationally large amounts of of maybe RSC. So that could be a way of uh, attracting them to the platform and getting them familiar with the bounties. And then we could tell them that, hey, you could also create your own bounties with this large sum that you've just won and like offload a lot of your work. That could be one way to do it. It's a great idea. That's that's a super great idea because we, we could just get rid of the buy side and just have Research Hub supply some of the initial bounties. And we could do it for content that like people might be interested in kind of viewing across the internet and like, share it around. So like maybe page that take this paper that's trending on a research hub and create a Twitter thread out of it and win like a thousand RSC for it. Yeah, I like that a lot. So like our, our community would put up bounties for people outside the community to come and fulfill. And then, yeah, I like that a lot. Do you think it also would be good to create some sort of, not a referral program, but essentially uh, hand out some REC for people to specifically only use for bounties, and you can hand out them to those e individuals who you have cold email. So you kind of already have an expectation of the level of the content they would probably provide. Yeah, definitely. So you're saying like when we reach out to people, if they're interested, then say, oh, hey, here's you know 50 bucks worth of research coin that you can mm -hmm. use to create a bounty that you're interested in, just see if it works. Yep. Yep, that's another great idea. We could even have like a kind of like a cashback program at the beginning where people that create bounties actually get some of those RSC in the bounty back once those are filled. Oh no, still ways to kind of like encourage people to create bounties. Something I was thinking about is okay, let's let's say someone creates a bounty. Um how do we then make sure that that bounty gets answered? Um, would it make sense to start from a specific field where we know we already have enough people on research hub to be able to fill that bounty, uh, going, talking about disciplines, scientific disciplines, because, you know, imagine we get people excited about the bounties, they put out the bounties and then there's no one that could actually answer to them. Yeah. Would it be so reasonable to, yeah. So smart. We should, we should pull our editors beforehand and find out like who's interested in answering questions or like doing some of these like use cases and already have people ready to go. So that way we can reach out to people who like we have expertise to actually help within our community. Um, yeah, that's that's super smart in targeting like specific fields of people where we already have the content creators. So I, I also think like um, the conference thing was mentioned. Um, to me, that's actually kind of a good idea. We're gonna have to like look into which conferences we'd actually wanna be a part of and maybe advertise that. But those feel like um, another like heavy human touch where we can actually show up and meet people and like put a human face to what we're trying to do and grab feedback in real time. Um, have you guys ever been to which conferences? Which conferences are we talking about? We'd have to do research and figure it out and probably kind of like what Ricardo was saying, like maybe there's like a sensors conference. Like if we have a bunch of sensors content creators, like we, you know, target it to people where we could help the most. But I guess in y'all's experience, have you ever gone to a conference and seen like a commercial product and been like, oh, damn, I guess I'll use that now. Yeah, like some of the really big conferences. So like SFN for the neuroscience and AAI, which is the biggest immunology conference, there's like a giant section of like vendors. Mm -hmm. So like usually it's like biotech companies trying to sell you a device or like products or something like that. But I think like something like this would be nice and easy and light. It's not like a, you know, hey, we want $50,000 to buy this flow cytometer. It's, hey, just come look at this demo, this like little two minute demo on the computer. If 
get involved to get a computer and hop on a website. Yeah, I think we could totally do it. We've been asked to like speak at like some kind of like field specific scientific conferences and pay pay money to like basically have it be an ad. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's definitely potential there. We could figure it out. Um, Mark? Yeah, I would just second to what Jeff said that like at least at medical conferences of each specialty, there are like tons of vendors and they come in all spectrum from pharmaceuticals to medical devices to research organizations um, um, to um, you know people who fund research and foundations so i mean we would fit really well and like we can choose which specialty where um, you know to go to or help out some of some of the conferences have only like paid boots but then some um, uh, depending on what type of organization you're presenting is not even like, you know, fully paid or like some half uh, paid or something like that. So yeah, that would really help get the name out there. Yeah, I think what makes sense in my hand here, order of operations wise is like, we do some cold emails or like other free marketing, like figure out which value props actually work. And then we go to a conference with that scoped in and like see if it can scale up. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So one thought that Pat Wu had, um, which I've also had success with in the past, is like um, grad student organizations. It makes me think of like the the science writing club that I mentioned earlier, like hitting up like kind of extracurricular organizations instead of like PIs themselves and saying, hey, like, you know, do the grad students at your school, would they be interested in like fulfilling bounties or do they have any questions they want to ask or whatever? Um, does that sound like a reasonable strategy to you all? I, I think that's pretty solid. I, I was part of the graduate student body um, at UCR and uh, how it would work would be there would be one representative and I'm not sure if other universities have this too where people can chime in if they do, but um, there's a representative from every department of every grad student or every grad program on campus. Um, and they have one representative and they all come and collect every month. And every month there's usually like some updates and like a pitch, you know, different people who want to make announcements can make announcements there. And usually that representative um, disseminates that information back to their entire department. So it kind of um, permeates its way through to all the grad students in the whole university. So I think something like that, where someone would go present like 15 minutes at this thing um, would kind of make its way ex exactly to our target audience. Yeah, it's a great idea. Well, one thing this makes me think of is um, like when I was in med school, like you get emails almost every day of like, hey, show up to room XYZ because they have a pizza, right? And like there's somebody pitching you on something, whether it's like a club or like, hey, join like my like um, like rotate through my lab or whatever. Um, and so I wonder if there's something that we can set up eventually where um, like we we pay people to host like events at their school um, and like throw a pizza party or whatever, uh, basically like pitching research hub um, to other people like in their own community. Um, so that feels like a like a hand to hand combat technique that could scale up like pretty well if, if it's if it's always like it's true. I love that. I love that. Like, yeah, I really love that. I think having undergrads host events for research hub is a great idea. Cool. Yeah, let's. I'll think about that one a little bit more because I. Yeah, I love the idea of like a campus reps program. Like I remember this is very corny, but when I was in college, like clothing brands would have like campus reps. They get like you know cheap clothes or whatever, and they'd be like yeah, yeah. Bring all their friends like to buy these clothes. So I think there's something similar we could try and do. Um, that's a good idea. If we're gonna do that, though, we need to like think about how we want to unroll it, what the students should meet when they come on the website, you know, cause it's kind of, we have to be really, really specific about what their experience is once they act, because that it's a little bit hitting mass market at that point. Um, even like not right away, but like that, those would be like the entry points into larger adoption. So we need to be really careful about that. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of work. Like we'd have to set yeah. it up in a way where like it's really easy for a random person to understand what they're supposed to do, which yep. I think requires like a lot of information. Um, so yeah, it would probably take like six months to really put that together well, but I do love that idea just in general. Like I think yep. there's a lot of stuff we could leverage if we got that set up.
what about for like private scientists? Like if we want to like find startup -y people or like biotech um, content creators, like how, how do we uh, get in front of them? I'm pretty sure that's it's probably going to be easier than actually finding uh, graduate students because maybe this kind of companies, they have some groups. I don't know, maybe LinkedIn have some LinkedIn lists where they, they share ideas in general or where they get trends and ideas about specific things. So maybe taking a look at one of those uh, groups and in general online finding uh, yeah, some forums where maybe, you know, they they discuss this kind of things. Uh, they, they all do different things. Obviously, they're all different startups, but I, I think there's some there's some places even where founders uh, share their ideas in between each other. It, it, maybe it's not even, you know, science related, but um, you could offer like we're offering kind of like a service. So it could be useful for a wide array of people. Uh, so maybe, yeah, again, I think, you know, um, internet groups is where we probably want to be do we know is there like a y combinator for biotech startups like something where it's like hey this could actually provide value to like this like social group where they're all kind of working on early stage stuff i can look that up there's berkeley biolabs i'm not sure if they're still operating but um they were the main one in san francisco i know like a lot of schools will have like entrepreneurship centers too so we could like yeah. try and find some cross pollination between like entrepreneurship and a graduate program. And like, I think yeah. those people would probably be interested. Uh, Safik? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask if anyone knew how uh, the VCs that are, uh, that are specific in, that are uh, specifically inclined in the biotech niche, how do they validate an idea? Uh, and if we know how they do it, could we, probably reach out to them and do it for them because i think uh it would be the most concentrated market of all uh like we could directly reach the assistant or the person running it uh i think that could be one way of uh sort of reaching all startups at once so Sapphic, you're suggesting we like cold email biotech vcs and offer them this like kind of product that their startups could use and maybe like give them some tokens you know beforehand in order to like uh use the feature for free kind of right yeah yeah i think that's genius that's a really really good idea um biotech vcs yeah that's such a good idea i like that a lot um Cool. What about, I guess undergraduates is still kind of the same thing, like um, reaching out to like extracurricular groups, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think they're, they might even be even more into like kind of like a organizations and government student bodies and stuff like that. I feel like when you're an undergrad, you're, you're trying to find your niche more than you are when you're a grad student. Um, so they're always flocking to different things. Um, so yeah, I think something like that makes sense for them too. Okay, cool. We offer the leaders of, you know, whether it's an undergrad or a graduate student organization, uh, ambassadorships, or well, I guess editorships. It might be that might be a good incentive um, for them to do something like that. Oh, I do like that because I think we we have a couple of editors um, who are not like. The most rigorously academically trained but they're like self-starters and um i think like have marketed stuff like their own entrepreneurial endeavors in the past so mm -hmm. we could definitely like hire a couple of editors where like the goal is more like a, a sales role than necessarily like creating content um yeah i like that that's a good idea Any other like uh, kind of overarching ideas on how we could potentially um, get in front of people for the bounties feature? What about visibility on Research Hub itself? Is that part of the discussion here or are you thinking about external ways? Uh, so you're thinking like a, a banner or like some kind of UI? A notification when a bounty is completed could be kind of, could be something, I guess. 
Yeah, make them stand up in, in all the ways, right? So make them give them some real estate on the main page or, and also highlight them in the uh, post history as you know, some special event, stuff like that. Do you get reputation for completing a bounty? Yeah, I think so. I think there's like an added reputation bonus. Um, awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't even know that. We'll, we'll um, probably next week, we'll demo uh, what the V1 looks like. Uh, and, awesome. And, yeah, there's some, some good details in there. Um, yeah, excited. I'm waiting for this one through it. I know um, like the, the plan is kind of eventually assuming like there's a little bit of traction that we'd build like a, like open bounties into the homepage. So you could like sort by bounties in your hub uh, if you wanted yeah. to answer them. And then we could have like a leaderboard too, where it's like, you know, who's completed the most bounties this week or, or something like that, just to bring attention to it on the homepage. So that's more V2 than V1? Yeah, I think so. I think the V1's just like the feature itself um to to get people creating content and then the v2 would be like in your profile page you have a list of all the bounties you've completed so that way you could like market yourself as the statistician who helps like academics you know in dermatology or like so you, yeah like, so you guys just plan on putting it there the same way you have like hubs or whatever just putting it on like bounties basically yeah in, in a very high level sense like we haven't gotten it designed whatsoever just like okay. we'd want to draw attention to the open bounties uh on the home page okay another thing we can do i guess is like tweet through the um main research hub account if there's like big bounties we could like put them out there um maybe even probably not send emails probably a bad idea but tweeting definitely Yeah, I think so. With the right hashtags or something like that, making sure that you're like targeting the right sub niche of like scientists that want to do it. I feel like there's like a lot of like big name PIs that are on Twitter that if we can somehow like leverage them to make some kind of announcement. Um, so you have like some kind of bounty that's a specific bounty for like researchers who do mass spectrometry or something like that, then having like a kind of leading PI in the field make a comment or like direct it to their students or something like that could be a good way to rally that. Yeah, one marketing feature we are building into the V1 is the ability to like automatically share a tweet, um, basically marketing your own bounty where you're like, I've got this bounty up, come complete it. Um, so yeah, we could definitely do something like that. I, I guess like to revisit the email idea, um, would you guys think it's spammy if, um because we can keep track of like who's uh signed up for which hubs so maybe there's a bounty in like you know the biotech hub maybe like once a week there's an email that says like hey here are the open bounties like are you interested i don't think that would be spammy at all i think that's a great idea okay cool. yeah once a week the, the digest and plus the bounties would be great i would i would say probably twice a week is good like in a recession making sure people are reminded that there's an opportunity for them to make money. Not very many people are going to be annoyed by that for the most part, I would say. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah, good good. Excuse me? That's good to know because I'm always hesitant to send emails, but if there's value in it, then I, I think we have a lot of people signed up, so that could be a good way to get in front of a lot of people. Okay, I like imagine, that idea too. imagine the title of the email like $10,000 in RC bounding bounties was added this week. I think that would be a really cool uh, email to speak to work on. That's great to know. Yeah, that's good context. I'm Again, I'm always scared, but it's good that you guys see value in it. That's you know not going to be annoying people. Awesome. Yeah, so, so any last thoughts here? So I guess the uh, the last thing to go over is like we've got this initial version working on staging, and so Kobe wants to host on either Thursday or Friday, or we can schedule it whenever um, for uh, fifteen minute to half an hour uh, user studies. Or basically, um, we'd have you hop on a call uh, with with the uh, staging website, and Kobe would like give a prompt saying like, "Hey, like, how do you um, you, you know ask a question with a bounty?" 
and then just see how people interact with the feature um because it's 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 kind of a new layout like i don't know if a lot of other websites have done this before so we want to like kind of show it to people and see what people's like initial reactions are um because sometimes it's hard to look at things you know with like new eyes when you've been thinking about it for a while so yeah i guess like just to throw it out there you can ping me afterwards if you're interested but um we'd love to have like uh three or four people you know who want to give half an hour um to help share feedback if you haven't seen it yet or or shared feedback and we can give some rcs a bounty to say thanks for the time but yeah if you're interested uh ping me afterwards and um we'll get that set up i know kobe's really excited about it cool um yeah, so that's all I had for this call. Uh, with the last like five minutes or so, does anybody else have any topics they want to bring up? Or Ricardo, anything for uh, SciCon that we can like help direct people towards? Yeah, not much, not much. Um, I can probably say that we are uh, getting increasing interest and we're getting more registrations, both as a uh, you know audience and registering for the competition. So that's that's really great. We're also finishing uh, our lineup for the speakers. So that's a really, you know, really great point that we're putting this all together. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have anything in particular. Um, you know, maybe the only thing is, you know, just a quick reminder, uh, we will do a, um, a, you know, we'll kickstart the the competition this, this Friday. Uh, we have actually extended the possibility to register until after the 15th, because, you know, maybe someone joins the call on the talk on Friday, they realize, okay, maybe it's not too hard to participate in the competition and they wanna join. So we basically extended the, the deadline. The registration deadline is now basically the same as the submission deadline. So you have the submission deadline on the 20, on 22nd. Uh, so if you, you can register also on the 21st, but then you'll have like one day to, uh, yeah, put up your submission basically. Uh, I think yeah, that makes more sense. Sorry? I think it makes more sense to do it that way, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've thought about it for, for, for a while, honestly. And Patrick today told me the same. So I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's change it. So uh, we, we're giving more more time to people. Um, and yeah, that's, that's that's pretty much it. I don't have much more. And One other thought I had, Ricardo, is like, I think there's a possibility that people will submit content without registering. Like they might just go to the website. Um, are we able to like, uh, I guess like, incorporate people if they're not registered and they've like you know posted something anyway we could do that um so in order to to submit the content you have to know that you have to submit it to the right hub so you have to have you, you definitely read the the rules or at least watch video so in that case probably people would have also registered but yeah obviously like if we find a submission in the you know in the in the cycle hub and that person is not registered we're, we can we can put that person in with with no troubles obviously yeah yeah absolutely. another thing we can do is like um if we make a post of the video we can pin it to the top of each hub so if people just show up to the hub they can like see instructions kind of like at, at the pinned top post on how to contribute okay so that's that's a long uh, i was planning to yeah that's a really that's a really nice idea uh, so i was planning to do shorter uh, loom videos where i go through the registration process the eln and so on. I just didn't have the time to do so because the, the Loom video that we have on the Wix side is pretty long. It's like more than three minutes. If you think that's still worth it, uh, we can we can you know uh, pin that on on top of the hubs. Otherwise, if you think it's better to have a shorter version, I can get to it and register a shorter video still with my Italian accent that I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, the Italian accent is money for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I think either way works. I, I think there's just a lot of potential for like once it actually starts and content's being submitted, like people will share it. And then just if, if like a friend shows up to the hub, like just an easy way to understand what's going on, I think it's worthwhile. Okay. okay. Either either video would be good. Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe there's also some technical constraints. I don't know. I can, I should probably ask Kobe as well. Because um, I don't know what it would take to to put up a banner with a video. Uh, but I think it's not it's not going to be a big problem. So, okay, I'll give it a thought. Cool. Um, yeah, so just a couple minutes left. Any other uh, final thoughts here? Yeah, 
Yes, just make a little tiny announcement. Um, so I've been talking to, and Patrick knows this, but I've been talking to um, one of my brother's friends who actually owns a journal. Um, and so we had a meeting over the weekend um, and they're like extremely excited to like figure out where like they can help out with the research hub and where research hub can help out. And like, it's actually a clinical journal. Um, Malik, maybe you're, you're interested in International Journal of Clinical Research, IJCR. Um, it has been in the last like three years or so. Um, and they've got like, I think they, at one point they were hitting like 180 publications a day um, going through their like journal and like their metrics are insane. Like it was, I can't remember how many countries that they're, you know, affiliated with. So um, they're super excited to like work with us. So we're, we're in talks with them and try to figure out how we could kind of leverage each other's communities. Um, and they've got a lot of things outside of just the basic publishing. They publish only open access and, uh, they have like other things where they're trying to develop educational content where they have memberships. And then there's like educational content for a lot of like the clinicians to learn how to do some like research related things. Um, so I think there's a lot of play overlap with research hub where we can kind of like leverage each other's community. So, uh, just a, a little shout out of like what's going on on the behind the scenes. That's, that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, a couple articles from the journal uh, discussed at one of the dermatology um, res um, journal clubs. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice journal. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for connecting. Yeah, it's actually, oh, go for it. I thought I was just gonna say thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the, it's my my older brother's really good friend from his uh, med school days is the person who owns the journal. So it was pretty easy to get in contact with them. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see where that goes. Maybe we'll report back next week. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas here. Like I'm, uh, I think it's a smart move to do a marketing campaign around this bounty feature, and I think we have like some pretty actionable stuff here. So yeah, excited to see what comes out of it. Thanks for uh, sharing all the brains. Okay, bye guys. Yeah, buddy.